Romans chapter 6, verse, uh, starting in verse 12, we'll pick up the second half of this chapter. One of the hard things about starting into Romans chapter 6 is to really feel like I've completed the thought. I need to read Romans 7, 8, and even 9 uh, mm -hmm. in order to feel like we've finished this study. And I wish we could do it all just in one day. Uh, it would be the best way to, to really teach it, I think. But uh, we'll, we'll do uh, each part and we'll kind of show, try to show how all of it connects uh, and, and works together. Verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. We, we pick up where we started or ended last week, where we're talking about how uh, we're putting sin behind us. That was a part of our former life. Uh, we were in a system of uh, under law, or maybe you even uh, there's a group that, that didn't know they were under law, or they didn't consider themselves under law, and they were just under lawlessness. Uh, but now we're under a system of grace, and uh, we're talking about how appropriate it is to continue living in sin once you are under grace. So that's the, that's the topic. Uh, here's where we pick back up. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. When we talk about who has the reins, a person should be able to come into your life, uh, uh, any person for that matter, uh, but namely God should be able to, to look into your life and ask the question, who is Lord here? Who is Lord here? Uh, I, I think of the, the, the famous uh, verse that we like to display in our homes. Uh, it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, that's, uh, you know, a, an ideal that you place on your household that once we come here, we're a group of people that serve God. Uh, that's kind of what that statement is trying to express. Can you express that with just yourself? Can you say, who's Lord here? It's God. Or who is Lord here? I serve the devil and I do his deeds. Uh, that's, that's the question we need to ask. And of course, uh, what Paul is trying to argue here is we should be able to, to look at ourselves and say, God is the Lord of my life. He's the one that's controlling what I do. And a lot of the rest of this is going to get into the fact that the actions that come out of the body are very much connected to who we are, our soul, and who is Lord of our life. So it matters the things that we do, uh, very much so. Uh, last week we touched on 1 John 1. Uh, I think there's a huge connection between these passages as far as uh, I think the analogy of walking in the light versus walking in darkness is a great thing to look at when trying to determine uh, how we ought to live in this passage. Are you walking in the light? If you are, good things are coming out of you. Uh, it's clear that you are uh, on a godly path. If you're walking in darkness, uh, you're still uh, in your sins. You're still uh, obeying uh, your former lust as it's uh, determined here. And so you're, you're living a life that's not... Uh, uh, in the light okay so I think that's a great analogy anytime you start to maybe get lost in this passage you might go over there and look at 1 John 1 uh, and that might uh, give some clarity Romans 6 verse 13 it says and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God now, what members is it talking about here? Is it talking about, you know, uh, members of your, uh, maybe your assembly? You know, you take a, a member of the, the church you attend at and you present them? Is that what it's talking about? I think, uh, based on what I'm reading here, when it talks about members of your body, it's talking about uh, parts of your body, okay? The reason uh, I would like to say that, uh, 1 Corinthians 
chapter 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about uh, members uh, of the body and presenting that uh, presenting that uh, towards God. I think I may have the wrong passage there. Have I written down the wrong passage? Someone may be able to, to tell me that. Uh, but anyhow, uh, or no, I just turned to 2 Corinthians, that's why. Okay, you present the, the members of the body of Christ, okay? When he's talking about the body of Christ, then the members, well, that's us. Okay, we're supposed to present ourselves and, and, uh, and, and work for the body of Christ. We're the, the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, you guys have heard uh, that phrase. I think in this passage, it's talking about uh, the members of our own body. Okay? It's talking about the heart and the brain and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, if we, if we look back at Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, this is Jesus speaking. It says, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. When he's talking about members, it's talking about parts of your body. Your right hand, your eye. Those are the members or maybe I think of it as like appendages uh, of your body. Um, that's all connected to your heart. It's connected to your soul. It's connected to who you are. The things that you do determine who you are. So it's not uh, like some have tried to do where they disconnect who they are from what they did. Uh, so... We cannot present parts of ourselves as instruments of unrighteousness. Uh, every, uh, almost every preacher I've ever heard that goes through this to uh, topic here of these words of Jesus, the first thing out of their mouth once they finish the verse is, well, now we know this isn't literally. Uh, he's, he's speaking figuratively. But I've often thought, isn't the logic still there? Wouldn't it be better to actually actually pluck out your eyeball uh, if it meant that you're in a better better course in life? I don't know. You know, uh, that's a, it's a difficult passage because it's very blunt that you don't want to be cast into hell. Right? Nobody wants that. And so what are you going to do about it is what we want to know. And Romans 6 is telling us, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That is what we are supposed to do with our body. It serves God in all that we do. What are you going to do with your eyes? How are you going to serve God? What are you going to do with your hands? What are you going to do to serve other people? That's what we're supposed to do. With God, you're committed 100%. From your hands, your body, your tongue, everything's committed. When you, when you got control of all of it, you ain't 100% committed yet. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when you bring up the, the tongue, you know, people don't connect uh, the words that come out of their mouth with, you know, Possibly being something that could be right or wrong, you know, it's just, well, it's just words, as people say, uh, it's just words. Uh, but but Christ was very clear, what goes in through the mouth is not what defiles a man, but it's what comes out of the mouth, and people don't think about that. It don't have to be bad words. It's just way you present yourself to people. Yeah. Be bad. You can be. You can say things just the wrong way and be yeah. wrong. For sure, yeah. So it's not just a list of six cuss words that's yeah. wrong, uh, stuff you shouldn't say, but uh, there, there's a lot that goes uh, into that list of uh, just, uh, you know, coarse jesting, uh, filthy language, uh, inappropriate joking. There's a list of that in the, 
the New Testament too that uh, you know it covers a lot uh, a lot of things once you list that out. But just think about that. That stuff that Jesus was saying, the stuff that was coming into your mouth, that is coming in and mixing with your body, he said that doesn't defile you. That's the stuff that came in. How did that not defile me? But the stuff that came out did. How crazy is that? The stuff that came out of you, that's what defiled you. But that it was something that left you. That's for sure. And so since that is coming from the overflow of your heart comes out of you, it is something that's capable of defiling you even though it's leaving your very mouth. That is true. That is true. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's something that we can see uh, in this passage that he doesn't just say you know, don't be unrighteous, don't don't sin. He's saying don't just get out of that in uh, slavery, but go into this one, is what this, the rest of this passage gets at, is you're not just not slaves of sin, you're slaves of righteousness. So don't just not say this filthy stuff, but use your words for righteousness. So yeah, I think those are all, all great points. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. Again, I, I like the, uh, the thought of who's Lord here? Who's got dominion over this body? Uh, is, it, is it being presented as God has got the domain here? He's, he's Lord, or is it Satan? Uh, who is Lord? One of the things that struck me in this passage is it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. When it says for, uh, in the second part of that verse, for you are not under law, but under grace, it's suggesting that they're, that they're providing a reason. They're providing a reason for why uh, sin does not have dominion over us. What is that reason? Based on this passage. It says, because we're not under law, we're under grace. Why is that the reason? Because I read that and I think of all the things that I can list as the reason for why I'm not uh, under sin. Or uh, under uh, the dominion of sin being over me. And I don't immediately think of grace being why it doesn't have dominion. But that's what that's suggesting here. Because we have this sin that's, that's uh, not put over us anymore, we're under grace, it just doesn't have control, it doesn't have dominion. Uh, that's what allows us to present ourselves to something else. Well, could it be that the law is earthly and we go back? I think the rest of Romans, if we could just read uh, at least the next couple of chapters, do a good job of explaining uh, why when we were under the law, we did not have uh, power over sin. Uh, we didn't have that power, but uh, I think it's a, a journey that I wish I could explain it uh, in just a couple words or a moment to explain exactly uh, why uh, grace is allowing that. I think the rest of the passage kind of gives us a summary, uh, but without spending a whole lot of time on just that particular thought and reading the rest of it, it's hard to get uh, a great idea at exactly how that works. But uh, grace, having that forgiveness, having that ability to not be enslaved to sin, that's what breaks us out of that slavery. 
Yeah, um, I think if you look at the earlier chapters of Romans, it makes it abundantly clear that the whole point of the law was to bring awareness of sin and bring sin to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And so this is similar to when Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You're either under the law or you're under grace. Mm -hmm. And so he says, you either serve God or wealth, but you know, similar concepts there, you're either serving yourself or serving someone else. And what this passage here is saying is, we talked about how the law is all about sin. The law is all about sin. The law is all about sin. We're not worried about the law anymore because now we're under grace. And we'll discuss a little more about what grace is, but we don't worry about that anymore. So that's how we've moved on. Is we've gone from law to grace. And that's the transition point that we have. And so you don't worry about sin anymore. You don't say, well, how do I sin? What do I do? What do I get away with? What do I? We're not worried about the details of that. We just focus more on other things because the law and sin are not the most important thing in our life right now. Not to say that we don't have a law. We have a different law. Yeah, and I mean, when they when they sin under the law, uh, like Scott said, they're they're focused on what do I do? Like, how do I how do I fix this? How do I, uh, you know, go to the priest and uh, get that atonement made uh, for myself? They're no no longer focused on what is good, and they're enslaved to the guilt uh, and and just not understanding the grace. Uh, that we now stand in that uh, you ask God to forgive you and go back to, to living in, in, in the right way I mean that's that's the, the path for us and so it truly is a great thing verse 15 he says what then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace certainly not he comes back full circle to uh, verse 1 he's again making that clear that uh yeah, we're not under law, we're under grace, but that doesn't mean that we just continue in sin. It means the exact opposite. And I think I'm glad that he made that point uh, because there were some apparently that were uh, unclear at this time. But the, here's what people don't understand, especially back out in the world, that if we're under a system of law, that clearly states uh, what sin is. Uh, it, it states your guilt for sin. It states uh, what happens when you sin and all of these laws and commandments. That to them, in their mind, is what's telling us, well, I, if these are all the laws and stuff, then I probably should never sin. But then we started to approach this topic of, well, now we have a, a free gift from God. We have grace. Uh, it forgives you of sins. So their immediate thought is, well, this law that we were just discussing was definitely against sin, but now we have grace, and it just forgives us of that? Well, which one was more against sin, law or grace? They think law. Uh, what we're discussing here is grace is every bit as much against sin as the law was. But it allows us to be free from the dominion of sin and puts us in a status where we are clean from our sin, uh, but we can, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be stuck in it, and we can go on living for God. Yes? We had to <clears throat> kill animals and sacrifice them and stuff like that the law <clears throat> and whenever we got grace, grace covers us for the rest of our life if we try to live as a Christian and we ask God to forgive us for whatever we do now mm -hmm. that lasts forever it's not it's not temporary yeah. like the law was mm -hmm. because the law did not forgive anything for any length of time yeah, yeah like we, we said last week that uh, Christ, uh, where is he now? Well, he's in heaven. He's still making mediation for us. And he's making constant mediation and forgiveness in the presence of God. Immediate. And so we ask God to forgive us. And, you know, we, we are forgiven. 
and we can feel confident in that, just as confident as any other uh, thing that God has promised us. Uh, Satan tries to convince us otherwise. We have to be confident in his promises. Uh, so I wanted to read uh, just a little bit into upcoming chapters. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, can't, shouldn't do that, says she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law, so that she is no adulteress. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that he should bear fruit to God. So it explains that. We're free to move from this to the other. And then it sums it up that uh, you're raised from the dead, you're in the body of Christ, and what do we do? We bear fruit to God. It's more focused on that. It's about what we now can use our body for. Uh, continuing uh, chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You can see how it's continuing in the coming chapters to discuss that very idea. But we're out of one and we're into the other. It's made us free from that law of sin and death. You sinned, you're under the law. If you sinned, you're under the law of death, that you deserve death. But what's the very thing that we're now being taught? You're in Christ, you're under grace. We're not under a law of death. We'll undergo physical death, but we're not bound by it, just like Jesus wasn't. And so that's uh, the status that we have now. true. Uh, back in chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Going back to verse 16, he says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves. Uh, that's one of those, those obvious statements. Well, everyone knows that. Everyone knows that uh, uh, whatever you present yourself to, if you present yourself uh, under that ownership, you are a slave to, uh, to uh, the law and to sin. And that's exactly what they were. That's what chapter 7 and chapter 8 tried to express, that uh, as long as they lived, they were under that law. And it literally had dominion over them. They were slaves to it, uh, and they had no escape, but now we do. Matthew 15, uh, verse 11, this is what we read earlier. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but, but what comes out of the mouth, uh, this defiles a man. <clears throat> when I look at uh, Romans, uh, Romans 6, verse 16, again, it's trying to connect the things that your body does, whether it be your arms, uh, your eye, or uh, even just your mind. What, are, what is it doing? What are you presenting it to do? Uh, if it's not being held in check, then it's being presented uh, when you, uh, back in Matthew chapter 5, uh, when you're looking at a woman to lust for her, you're not keeping your mind in check. You're allowing it to uh, think uh, whatever uh, it wants to think. Uh, growing up, uh, just talking to, to other guys uh, and their thought process on that verse. 
I mean, they, they essentially threw that out of their Bible because they're like, well, I mean, there's no way you can, you know, look at someone and not, not lust, you know, they, you know, good try with that one. And that was literally what everyone was saying about this passage. Uh, but if you, uh, if you really look into uh, what it's trying to suggest to us, are you ever going to mess that up? Probably, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think what Proverbs 7 teaches us is you have to make a covenant with your eyes. You make an agreement with your eyes as to what they're going to do. You're going to honor God or you're not going to. And so you have to make those decisions. Will you mess it up? Uh, probably. Uh, but what are you presenting your members for? You just let them do whatever? Or are you keeping them in check and using them for something good? Verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Uh, before we're in Christ, uh, before we know uh, how we ought to live, uh, our heart uh, is, is full of evil. It's not been presented or been convicted of sin. And, and so one of the, the passages I thought of was before uh, the people uh, in Acts chapter 2, before they realized before they were convicted of what they had done, uh, their, their heart was uh, not convicted. It was not uh, telling them that they were wrong. Uh, but then as, as Peter gives them that sermon, explains to them who Jesus was, uh, what they had just done to him, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, uh, what shall we do? So it's a it's a journey of convicting uh, ourselves of the sin that we have committed. And so they obeyed, verse 17 of Romans 6, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Uh, it convicted them there. It cut them at their heart. It broke their heart. And... Then they submitted their heart and obeyed what Peter had told them. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. So they, were, they, they made that decision based on uh, what they learned. Verse 18 in Romans 6. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of uh, lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. <clears throat> I, I like the way he says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. I kind of picture uh, Paul because he's, uh, he's in the spirit. Uh, I don't know exactly what all uh, that allowed him to see. But I imagine he can see this, this force of good versus evil and the uh, inner spirit as it battles to do good versus evil. And you see a little bit of that dialogue in chapter 7. Uh, but he can see that he needs to explain this in a way that we can understand it where uh, he compares it to being a slave. Uh, we're either going to be slaves to this or slaves to this. And I think... Uh, putting it in those terms allows us to see uh, the very first question that we asked. Who is Lord here? Who's Lord of your life? You're going to be a slave to something, so what's it going to be? John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, that's one of those passages, I don't know if anyone else does this other than me, but I, I've read that passage a lot, and I just, that's one of those, like, kind of famous sayings, and I'm like, that, that sounds really good. You know, that sounds like a really good one-liner, like at the end of a movie or in like a, you know, climax moment, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I'm like, 
But what does it mean? What does it mean? Have you, have you really uh, stopped and thought about that? That as you know the truth, what is the truth in this very passage? If we can attach it to the collective narrative of the history of, of mankind, okay, let me explain what I mean. That God created man, man turned away from God, he had every reason to say, I'm done with you. And his anger showed exactly how tempting it was for him to do just that many times. We see so many examples. And yet, what did he do? He allowed part of himself to be hung up on the cross to forgive and have mercy, uh, kindness, grace, something we didn't deserve or earn, to now collect us back. And so, they didn't, they didn't get that story. The Old Testament, uh, when they're under that law, uh, and even especially Paul's audience now, uh, they didn't get that whole story until the truth hit them. They thought, we're under this system of commandments, and you know, as long as I'm a son of Abraham, I'm good to go. Uh, keep the commandments, I'm good to go. They didn't see the truth. Once that truth hit them of how much God was trying to show his love, uh, and you can be set free from the law of sin and death. That, I mean, that set them free to have that truth, to have that knowledge that they just have to repent and be baptized. It set them free from the thought that they're under uh, sin and death. Uh, continuing in verse, uh, verse 20, it says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Well, I think back, back in John chapter 8, and sorry if I'm having to flip back and forth, but uh, continuing that passage, I think there's a lot uh, that we can see uh, works back and forth in these passages. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. It's using the same terminology. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Isn't that true? We have to be a son of God. And they were uh, slaves of that sin. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak that I have uh, what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. Who does he call them? Uh, who does he call their father? Well, uh, that's what they, they call their father, and they argue about it. Uh, but verse 44, he says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in it. That's, that's what they were a part of. If you're outside of God, that's, that's what's going on in your life too. You haven't been set free. Uh, you're you're under the control of the of the evil one, and uh, he we we obey his will. Uh, that's that's what uh, is clear at least uh, in this situation, and I think it's clear in the world too that uh, we're we're slaves of of whatever our desires are, whatever uh, Satan puts in front of our face, uh, we fall victim to. And we have to be set free from that uh, by coming into obedience of Christ. And there's only two, right and wrong. That's, that's right. Uh, back in Romans 6, verse 21, What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness 
in the end, everlasting life. There's some things I wanted to talk about here as far as uh, being convicted of our sins, uh, talking about uh, things that we're ashamed of. Uh, like it says in verse 21, I want to start with the story with uh, John the Baptist. What was his uh, what was his teaching? The overall message of his teaching. <clears throat> if you had to uh, maybe sum it up in one word. That Jesus was coming soon. Okay, Jesus is coming soon. And what do we need to do? Repent. There, okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was getting at. He he was preparing the way for Jesus. Uh, he's coming soon, and so he wanted people to repent. Uh, he wanted to make straight uh, the path uh, and prepare uh, for who was coming next. Laying the foundation of repentance is a big deal uh, with us coming to Christ, and it also is a big deal for us reaching the lost. Have y'all thought about that recently? How are, we, how are we going to get people to repent? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a difficult topic. Um, but how, how is that? Uh, how, how hard do you think that was for John the Baptist? Uh, he had a tough message. Uh, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up, he didn't say, uh, Welcome, brother. Glad to see you. We'd like you to repent. But he said, You brood of vipers. Well, that wasn't too welcoming. Uh, and that's not necessarily what needs to be the case in each situation. Uh, I'm not saying you call someone that or, or don't necessarily. It is hard uh, to talk about repentance. Uh, one of the things that I think we need to be doing as Christians that I think we'll see uh, later on in this passage is that <clears throat> We need to explain that we too were sinners. Be upfront with that. Uh, share that. When when Paul goes on his rhetoric of all the stuff that he did, don't you think we too could be a little bit upfront with the people that we're trying to meet with and study and convert to Christ? Instead of acting like we are now perfect, we could talk about what Christ has done. Look at the very words of, of Paul uh, later on uh, in this passage. He says, O wretched man that I am. That's how he described himself. And who did he say was going to, to, to fix his situation? Jesus. Okay. When we're sharing the gospel, that was in uh, chapter 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's him explaining who, who had fixed his situation. That's the type of thing we need to be sharing with other people. I think people realize that they're they're entangled in in life and, and how it brings them down. Uh, and, and if we can be up front and share with them how we were tangled as well, and Jesus brought us out of that, I think that's a great thing. Uh, back in Matthew chapter three, verse six through eight, it says and they were bap they they baptized uh, they were baptized by John in the Jordan. They were confessing their sins. They came forward and they felt comfortable sharing what they had done and being baptized. How are you going to get somebody to come forward and confess all of their guilt and their sin in front of you when 
maybe you haven't done that for them. We have to be upfront and honest with people, uh, confess your sins, and show how we are all in the same boat. Just one of us has Jesus to, to put us in the right spot. That's, that's really the only fix. Uh, we have to be willing uh, to share that. I think convicting someone of their sin is the hardest part of converting anyone. I really do, because that's the, that's the hard part. You're, you're attacking who they are. They don't want to admit that they're wrong, uh, but if you'll do it first, uh, maybe sometimes they will follow along. I think that's the, a, a, great, a great strategy, a great, a great route to take. But look, you're not going to be able to confess your sins to them and share how guilty and wrong and all of your mistakes if you're not unashamed of what you've done. We don't have to be ashamed of what we've done. Uh, is there uh, initial guilt? Yes. And, and, and Paul says, a wretched man that I am, he was ashamed of the things he, he, had, he had done. But he also knew he was forgiven. He said, praise be to God uh, through Jesus Christ. He knew the solution, and he made that very clear to people. What do you do if uh, you can't get someone to believe the Bible? I mean, they may believe that in God, and they may believe that they're, you know, that some things in the Bible are true, but some things are not, and that's the way they feel. How do you get people past that? That's a, that's a difficult question. Uh, difficult thing to answer uh, you know there are there are a lot of uh, what people call apologetics okay what that means is people look into uh, certain ways to prove the Bible uh, to back it up uh, to to do all that uh, those are great things to look into uh, if you're interested in that uh, but for me uh, just for me I, I think those things are interesting but I also think that the Bible speaks for itself. And uh, the more uh, truth that you can show from it uh, to that person, the better off you're going to be. The more you can display it in your own life to them. It's not just words on a page, but this is who I am and this is what I'm up to. The more you can show them all of that, uh, the more believable it's going to be. I think you look at the origin of why they look at that Bible, uh, that's God trying to send them a message, the reason they don't believe it, and they're having hang-ups with that, is Satan has sent you know, something into their mind uh, to cause them to hold up, uh, to cause them to slow down. It could be other uh, people that they have not seen living that out correctly, and they just get the wrong idea. Uh, it could be uh, situations in their life that they uh, are angry at God about. Uh, you never know, but usually Satan has some sort of uh, a stronghold over that person's heart, keeping them from trusting in what is in the Word. And what does God tell us that can take down any stronghold? The Word of God. And, and the more we study it, the more we're prepared for uh, sharing with people and, and tearing down any, any stronghold that exists. Uh, and I think it's capable of doing that. Uh, it cuts people um, uh, to the heart. Uh, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It's not words on a page. It's, it's living and active. And I, I, I mean, as long as you believe that and, and share that with people, uh, you just hope that they'll see it. You know, you can't make them, but you do your best, and, and you hope that they'll see it. That's all you can do. Yeah, that's, that's all you can do, and, you know, pray about it, and that's, uh, that's it. I mean, anybody else got anything on that? It's well, difficult. <laughs> sometimes you have to understand, some people will go to the Bible looking for what they want to see, yeah. and if they see something they don't want to see, they will find a reason not to want to believe that that should be part of the Bible. 
Okay, there are there are people who literally cut out sections of their Bible. There are people who figuratively cut out sections of their Bible, and they say, I don't think I trust anything by the Apostle Paul because he wasn't really an apostle. And usually the root of that is there's something that he says that they disagree with. There's some topic where he has made a specific statement because he has a lot of specific statements. And they don't like one or more specific statements, so they say, I don't believe anything Paul says. Or they'll find something that they just don't want to believe somewhere, and so they say, so it must not be true, right? And we deceive ourselves all the time. And unfortunately, sometimes if you start deceiving yourself and saying, this is right, even though scripture explicitly says it's wrong, you can get to be one of those people that Paul describes as if their uh, consciences were seared with a hot iron. And sometimes you'll find a person that how much you try to discuss and persuade and show them, they're not going to believe. Mm -hmm. It's it's sad, but it's true. You get to a point where, not through any fault of somebody else, through your own choices, you decide, I'm just not going to believe it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you can still pray for them, you can still try to help guide them, but until and unless they're willing to accept the truth of Scripture, there's not much you can do. There, there's a couple passages like Romans 1 and uh, I think uh, 2 Peter talks about uh, God sending a strong delusion mm -hmm. on, on people that have uh, you well, know, been up to unrighteousness and, and all sorts of uh, ungodly things. And at that point, they're delusional. That means that they, you don't have, uh, you can't reason mm -hmm. with a delusional person, you know, and it, at that point, it's probably not going to. To work uh, for them, you hope that maybe that's not the case. There's people all the time that that didn't trust that there's people that were atheists and then they they turn things around. So it is possible for many uh, to change change their mind and their heart. What I do for that is what I do. I just pray for somebody else that might be able to tell them something that I haven't been able to convince them of. And I pray for that kind of stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I feel like that's all I can do. Yeah. It is difficult. Sometimes you're, especially if it's someone that's close, you know, at that point you may have said all you can say and they don't want to, you know, listen to you anymore and maybe they'll listen to somebody else or maybe, you know, God has to, you know, soften their heart and then they're more ready for, what you have to say, it just it really depends. So, uh, anyhow, I'll read the the last verse here. Uh, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, what a great uh, verse! What a great thought uh, to end on. I hope that nobody reads that verse. Uh, that uh, is probably the most famous one in Romans six uh, as a standalone verse. Uh, the context leading into it is uh, that uh, we have a free gift, but that does not imply that we keep living in sin, uh, that we've come to Christ, yet it's appropriate to live in sin. It's clear what we're supposed to present our bodies to be. And under that system of being a slave to righteousness, we have a free gift from God, uh, no guilt of sin, uh, no wage of sin, uh, no death. We have none of those things under this system, and that's a really special thing. Uh, but you can see where quite easily, if you took verse 23 uh, out of context, you uh, took it with maybe a guilty heart uh, under a system of law or something else or misunderstanding what grace is for, you might think the wages of sin is death, but I have grace. And so I'll just do whatever I want to, you know, and that's just, that's simply the wrong thought. Uh, but since, uh, since we know what the right thought is, we present ourselves to Christ, we have a very special gift from God, eternal life. And just like any gift, if you don't take it and use it, or, or the way it should be used, yeah. then uh, it's no good to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why people don't. Yeah. 
people are trying to uh, yeah people try to steal the gift rather than receive it and uh, it reminds me of uh, John chapter 10 when when Christ talks about being the, the sheep gate uh, he talks about thieves and robbers will try to go in and and go in the you know over the fence not through the gate uh, Find some other way around and, and steal the gift. And he says, he holds who gets it. And so, though you may come into this system of, of grace, uh, if you're not in Christ and presenting yourself as a slave to righteousness, well, he's still the gate. He's the keeper of the gate. If you didn't come in through that gate the way that he decided, well, he knows. He knows who came around the back door. And so that's that's what we have to uh, recognize is that God knows all things. And so we, we take this system of grace, but we, we receive it. We don't try to steal it or, or do something falsely with it. Sure. Well, thank you all for class. Thank you for the comments.